our program is funded through the generosity of the Montclair Public Library Foundation through its donors, as well as through grants from the Montclair Foundation and Investors Foundation. As a 15-year member of the library board, president for five years, I want to extend my own welcome to you and my delight at this program. I am very excited to hear both what David and what Nathan have to say, and those aren't just mere words. In my day job, I'm a congregational rabbi, and if you know anything about Jewish life, you know what's coming up. And I got two sermons a lot of eager people <coughs> waiting for this week, and they're not yet written. Nevertheless, I am here. <laughs> Um, it's also a pleasure to welcome these two particular gentlemen. David and I seem to have wandered back and forth into each other's lives for quite a few decades now. We, we were both graduate students at Columbia, though we didn't know it at the time, but then we met in 1992 when I officiated at his wedding to Beth. Right about that time, they moved to Mississippi, and my wife moved from Mississippi up here to be married to me. But clearly, David, you missed me because not so long later, you and Beth and your son moved up here to Montclair. It's nice to have you back. And years. one word, <laughs> Peter introduced Nathan English, or more than appropriately, one of the most noted authors in contemporary American fiction and somebody both critically and popularly respected. But I just want to share one observation about his work with you. Um, I was a rabbi living in South America for a number of years during the period of the repression that was the subject of his amazing book, The Ministry of Special Cases. And I told him beforehand that it was not just a great novel to read, but the way in which he so beautifully evoked the feeling of that, the horrible feeling of that place at that time was nothing short of miraculous. So I'm very excited to be here. I hope you are too. David? On to you. Thank you, very much. Thank, you so much. thank you for a nice introduction, um, Cliff. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, what I think we'd like to, well, what we'd like to do is start off with a brief reading um, from um, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, and then I'm going to pitch questions to Nathan. Um, he's going to bat them out of the park. We'll talk back and forth and leave plenty of time for Q&A, which I'm sure um, many of you have, both Qs and As. Uh, <laughs> and that will be the program. Super. Uh, thank you. Really, it's lovely to be out here. And just whenever you leave the city, anyway, uh, it's a beautiful neighborhood. <clears throat> I'm in Brooklyn with a kid now, and everyone slowly disappears to Montclair. They're just like, I was like, where's apartment 4D? Montclair. Um, and excuse my death voice, I'll just hopefully live till Monday or at least through the hour. <clears throat> anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to ask yes, for a couple of minutes reading just so you could hear my voice. And I mean, my not this scary one, the literary one. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to get loud. We gonna, can we turn this up? No? Anyway, um, I'll boom. How it had come to this, prisoners he felt, had been set so very early, his Jerusalem, his Israel, his end. He'd been given it so long ago back in suburbia, back in America, a birthright spoon-fed to him in his Jewish day school classroom, a little boy with a heavy prayer book and a yarmulke like a soup bowl turned over and resting atop his head. It is second grade, and they are running, the children with their arms outspread, they are flying. The desks are pushed together, the teacher's orders, their lovely 18-year-old teacher who would soon get pregnant and disappear. They knew enough, the boys and girls, to love this black-haired lady whose even more black, more beautiful hair peeks out from under her wig as she pushes the big desk, the teacher's desk, towards theirs. She dresses modestly, but there is no modest when you are a beautiful, raven-haired, 18-year-old second-grade teacher flushed from trying to get pregnant in all your free time. <laughs> Their love for her was different from what they felt for the others. It was marrying love and wanting to be her love, and it was youthful, energetic teacher love, and they would do anything for her, anything at all. So when after morning prayer, after marching into the room with their brig green sedurum and taking their seats when she'd stood and jutted out her bottom jaw and blown the hair from her <laughs> eyes, when she'd said, up, up, and raised her hands, raising the class so easily with them, prisoner Z's no longer sure if she'd actually spoken the up, up at all. <clears throat> 
we are going somewhere and we are late is what she says. Where are we going? Ask Bacha, whose English name is Beth. A smile from the teacher, a glimmer to the eye. We are going, my little Yiddelach, to Yerushalayim. We are flying right now to Israel. The Mashiach is coming, and we need to get there. We need to help welcome him in. And the hands again are waving, and we are all already following. Now push, push the desk together so we can get up into the sky. And when those desks are all together, a circle around the room, the teacher takes one of our tiny chairs, raising her skirt so we can see her ankle swathed in her scratchy gray tights. She places a foot on the seat of that chair and then climbs onto those child-sized desks. A teacher, a teacher standing on a desk. It is glorious. She bends a bit at the knees and leans her head forward. The teacher then spreads her arms wide. She says, I am on an airplane. I am an airplane. We are all flying to Israel together to make Aliyah. We are headed to Jerusalem. We must hurry, hurry, a long flight, and the Messiah is already on his way. And she takes off like that, flying from desk to desk around the room, tilting her beautiful covered arms on the turns. Come, she says, come. You do not want to be left in Gullus, forgotten in this Egypt. When the Messiah comes, our country awaits and it is roly-poly Benz who is first up. And then Mayor Aryeh follows, flashing his monkey grin. There are Devora and Yocheved, Susan and Zev. And then I am on the chair. Prisoner Z feels himself rising. But with all those arms tilting and everyone running and howling and flying, I'm too afraid to join. And suddenly I am grabbed, and suddenly I am lifted. The teacher has got me. She is holding me, and she sets me down in motion. And that is love and that is care. She holds on until my feet are moving and my arms spreading until I too, I feel it, until I am looking down at the classroom below, down at New York, at America, until it all looks like desert and all looks like wasteland, nothing but the emptiness that is the whole world outside what God gave us. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, again, that's just an excerpt from um, Dinner at the Center of the Earth. His second novel just came out last year. Sort of a thriller, sort of a love story. Um, we'll talk a bit about that um, in a bit. Um, but it's, it's as, as I see it, sort of an attempt to trace what gets, um, and, and please correct me along the way um, sure. if, 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 it's, if it's wrong, um, what gets an American um, a Jewish kid from the American suburbs into Israel, into some heavy espionage, something that goes rather wrong, so that he ends up in, interned in a black site in the Negev desert. Um, and that's how the novel starts. That is, this person's been incarcerated for years. And you slowly learn what he did, how he did it, and so on. It's, it's, it's masterful how it sort of slowly unfolds. Um, and you choose to start with the, I mean, what you read is sort of the, the, in, yeah. the inevitable infatuation with the second grade teacher. Yeah. Where does, where does this kind of zealotry start? Where do, where do you trace the chain sort of from the kid to prisoner yeah. Z? That is a grand, I won't rate your questions, but that's a grand question. That's a grand place to start. Uh, it's, you know, uh, I guess these, you know, I'm obsessed with realities, like our grasp on reality, where realities come from, like how our brains, like I've been trying to rewire my brain, you know, for my whole life. Like there's these embedded, you know, truths that are just the truths that I was given. And, that, you know, I guess that's why I start with this sense. I lived in Israel. This is a book, like, uh, and you already did a masterful job of trying to explain it, my poor editor that I've been with for 20 years. I mean, you know, this book, it's, yeah, it's literary thriller and magic realist history of Israel, and then it's sort of a love story, but really it's an allegory. You know, I call it a turducken of a novel. <laughs> but, but I guess the point is I moved to Israel for the peace process in 1996, and I stayed there for five years straight, and I watched it crumble. Those were the bad Septembers, Intifada II in 2000, and then I was back in New York, for, uh, which was just September 11th, uh, 2001. But I, I guess I... It's, 
you know, I finally lived long enough. We were talking about my changing author photos. Like, I, this is my first uh, book tour with reading glasses. Like, I finally lived a little bit of life enough to see history change. It sounds crazy to talk about the inevitable piece. It was just the 25th anniversary of the signing. It's in the papers this week. Like, the piece was right there. It was happening. We were making peace. There were going to be two states. It was just over. You know, and now to talk about it, it sounds absurd and ridiculous and like a crazy person idea, but I was there, and that's what I moved for, and, and watching it be dismantled, watching it torn apart, like, it, it, it both broke my heart but fascinated me of, like, how history works, how the world works, and I guess I just want my peace back, but what I wanted to do was also to write a book that explored that notion and explored those dual realities, and it's a ridiculous... It's not only a structurally ridiculous novel, and thank you for being nice about it. Like, no, it's it, cool. It, you know, it's 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 an it's an in, insane book, but I really wanted a book where both realities run through it. And you know, I'm sitting up here, and I always, you know, I try not to get anyone angry anymore. I'd be like, I don't even write Jewish thing. You know, everything I have is Jewish. Every th <laughs> idea is Jewish. The food is all my stuff is Jewish. But I personally. That's a normal way to be to me. I, I don't feel Jewish. I just am. You know what I'm saying? I'm, you're more than welcome to see a Jew up here. Like, look, <laughs> Jew. Look at two if you want. Anyway, but the point is, you know, but to me, I just, I'm obsessed with injustice and how reality forms. And I think that's it. I, there's no other subject in the world. All I do is talk about Israel and Palestine. Like, there's no subject that people come to more like locked and loaded. Everyone who's interested in the subject has a position. Their position is inviolable. They don't bend. It's so fierce. And also, everyone thinks they're either center or left, depending no matter what side they're on with this. And I just, I, it's a John Gardner. I won't answer the first question for an hour, but it's a John Gardner concept. I used to love John Gardner. I don't know. We're in the library. I don't know if people read him so much anymore. Art of fiction, sure. Yeah, on moral fiction, the art of fiction. We both teach fiction. But he talks about fiction as a place, which is what it functions for as me as a reader, and that's how you end up writing, as a place to test morals, a place to reflect. And I just wanted to build a book. I have my own very fierce opinions, which are just dead center. But anyway, but the point is, I just wanted to build a book where people could maybe read and enter this and, and, and just think about how they think about Israel and Palestine. And that's, that's why it has the, the, the conflict is so circular. The, the wars are so, the Gaza wars go to Wikipedia. They have names like Fast and Furious movies, like Castle. You know, you can't have a war that's scheduled again and again every two years, but the world does. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to build a story that could contain both those realities. Um, that's a great answer. Um, one of the follow-up questions um, that, that, that I want to pursue um, as long or short as you want to take it is this intersection of the personal and historic that you do so well, whether it's a family caught up in Argentine's dirty war in your first novel, um, a bully beating up Jewish kids in How We Avenge the Blums, a, a really good short story. They're all really good short stories. Um, this idea, do you, I mean, in terms of your own process, do you sort of write like personal and how it's affected by larger, smaller, larger? Do you yeah. see intersecting circles? Do you do it all of a piece? Oh, you're, uh, I really appreciate these. Uh, Sorry, I'm a creative I, I, writing no, instructor. No, that's right. <laughs> you're going right to the heart of it. But uh, I think so many writers' careers go in the opposite direction in terms of writing close and distance. I was so terrible as a suburban kid. And I like your suburbia better, but like Long Island, you know, the very armpit of Long Island where I grew up, like I just, you know, I was terrified by that notion where they'd say, like, write what you know. To be a writer, you have to write what you know. And I was like, I didn't even have my own thoughts. They're just sitcoms. When I think of childhood, I was raised by a TV set. So my own memories are basically <laughs> scripted television. So I thought I can't be a, I literally thought I can't be a writer because I have had no experience beyond the mall. And you know, and you're going to yeshiva. I was in school from like 7 AM to midnight and then watch TV. Like there's no, there's nothing. There's no experience there. And then I understood that like write what you know was that it, that it should be taught as experiential knowing. Like have you ever loved, have, you know what I'm saying? If you got turned down for prom, did that shatter you? Like that's enough shattering to have not summited K2 in a novel or to have failed at a coup or what, you know what I'm saying? Like your emotions, that's knowing. And so for me, I started Distance. My first story that's like, it's what got me into grad school. And it was the first story in my first book. And it was, I've written now a, a second play that's on its way out. But I had a play at the public. It was my first play. But this story, I, I wanted to write about being a, what does it mean? I didn't think I'd ever be sitting here, really. Thank you for coming out of your homes. I didn't think I'd be sitting here as a writer. But I thought, like, 
I was going to write every day till I died. I was like, okay, if I write every day and no one ever reads a word, do I die a writer? That's all I wanted to know in my late, like I just had that question. But for that, I said it in a Stalinist prison camp, you know, in 1952. You know, like that's, so for me, it took me a long time to start moving towards the personal. And it was with the last book, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank. I just never thought about it. My sister and I always made order. We just, if we meet new people, we'd say like, you know, if we meet people, we'd just be like, oh, they would hide us or not. Our, when, we meet, <laughs> when we meet Gentiles, my sister, if we like, that's the shorthand with my sister, whether they would hide us or turn us in. That's it. Since I'm little, you know, and I just never thought about it. And then it came up as an adult, and I was like, oh, that's path, like, that is downright twisted. <laughs> Like, that might be interesting to other people, you know? And, and so that was like a moment for me where I started coming closer in my story. So for this novel, uh, it was my last book tour. I was flying back. It was the last day in Israel. The cover of the um, newspaper was this guy, Prisoner X, in real life, an Australian. He was so much like me. Hmm. I couldn't tell. Like, I can't even tell you. He maybe got more Zionism, and I got more like fire and brimstone. But he had just hung himself in a cell in Jerusalem. Yeah. And, but th the thing is, back to thanks, we're very dedicated to Kafka, because it saved us like 50 minutes of explaining Kafkaesque, what that would mean, so in a Kafkaesque manner. But I thought about this guy. He hadn't lived until he died. Like, he didn't exist when he killed himself. So I was like, wait a second. There's a guy who's dead who now lived because he was dead, and he hung himself from a cell, but there was no cell to hang from like whence to hang himself until the moment of successful hanging. That tickles my brain. That fascinates me. But it was more the notion of what it is, how you end up moving to a place. I'm interest, I was interested in my own, my own belief, how dedicated I was to peace or to the city of Jerusalem, which I still love that city and believe in it so much, just as a special place. Like I just, yeah, more and more I started to take distant, crazy ideas and move my own craziness together. And that's sure. when I thought, like, that's why I built a spy that would be a very bad spy like me. And by the way, back to talking about Jewish stuff all the time, I, I got to do the spy cast in Washington, D.C. on this book tour. And I was like, I think this is, we just talked about spy craft in this book. It's my first, like, I'm so literary. I was so happy. I was like, I think this is my first hour not talking about Jews in my whole life. We talked about spy craft. But some people are really interested in the spy craft in this book, and other people are like, oh, well, that's not a real spy. They're a bad spy. But I'm really defensive about that, because every spy story we know is a bad spy. We don't hear about the good spies. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, pretty much every story we have is someone who turned or flipped or failed. You know, like, that's the point. The good spies, you're just like, oh, what happened to Dave? You're like, oh, he had a heart attack. It is dead. You know, you don't hear about the perfume bottle and the garbage pail. Like, that is a failed mission in England. That poor man who's fine now. But. Um, no, that, that all makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Never having been a spy, I can say that. Um, but there are two directions to follow this up in. Um, I want to talk in a moment about thrillers, because I know um, yeah. both novels resemble that. But um, what you'd said halfway through about you know, the, the crazy setups and so on, um, the short story collections of novels, they've got great setups, you know, whether it's a wasp businessman who suddenly turns into a Jew in the back of a car ride home, or a rabbi hired to play Santa at a department store. And they're, they're endless great setups. Um, and I'm curious, um, is that what, I mean, because different writers start differently. Poets may start with a line oh, yeah. that beguiles them. Someone else may start with an opening or an ending. Is it the setups that get you started? What, what moves you to oh, uh, start a story? Every, I use the word organic a lot when I teach and stuff. Like I'm, there, there's two. Uh, now I want to drop the whiteboard and start talking about the bifurcated brain. I did an event with a psychiatrist like ten years ago that changed my life. I've been really interested in the creative process. There's two parts of it. There's the conscious part. That question so ties in the two parts of the brain. Like there's the conscious you that's writing. I'm. Uh, in crazy uh, round-the-clock rewrites right now. Like, that's a conscious me looking in a sentence and say what makes it tick. And then there's the moment of, like, creation, which is sure. something we all respect and are terrified of. So yeah, I think everything has its own, you know, organic start. Like, the guy turning Jewish, I just, in a taxi, I just heard this couple, like, arg I saw an apartment. I heard this couple arguing and, like, just wrote it. You know, or sometimes it's to, you write towards the last line. Sure. I, I call it executing the inexecutable. Hmm. And a lot of these structures, I'm very interested in. I'm alone in a room all day. Now I have a dog with me. Like, <laughs> I, 
it's, it's not interesting to me to write anything that I think can be written, even if it's like torturous to my wife or the people around me, like I'm always pulling out handfuls of hair. But like this novel, you can't weave seven timelines and have two real. it doesn't, you know, like sure. the end of the Argentina book, I saw this end, it's just, impo like I said, there's no way to write my way to there and then it took me near a decade. So yeah, even that idea of a, a Jewish Santa like a really religious, like black hat, sort of Hasidish dude, like working to pay for his show as Santa Claus. Like, <laughs> even that idea, like, why is that inexecutable to me? I, it's a, just a joke. And I thought, I don't want to write it as a joke. I want to write it as a very serious, empathetic story. And that to me, like, even that hearing that what is a punch, like, when he said it, thank you for laughing, thank you for delivering it in a way that was laughable. Like, but that idea, yeah, I heard a joke in my head and said, but I'm going to write it serious. And that just seemed impossible to me. That's one of the things I think you're particularly um, resonant with. That is, um, this serial comic style, for lack of a, a better term, um, I think of it um, as, as something, you know, extracting humor from suffering, which is something an awful lot of persecuted groups know, especially Jews, um, given our history. Um, and again, at the risk of asking a sort of creative writing question, how do you do that? How do you elicit a laugh and a gasp of pain at the same time? Oh, uh, that is real. Um, you know what? Uh, I, I've been back to the brain trying to remember what my job is at any given moment. Hmm. Like, that is beyond my control. I, I can't do that. My job is, yeah, uh, this is so, I really try and be cynical, and if someone scream out a tragedy, I'll make a joke. Like, I, I really try and be jokey and cynical all the time. Like, this, the process, process stuff is so sincere to me. I can't tell you. Like, I believe in it so much. I've dedicated my life to it. I, I love what makes it work, but I'm so obsessed with the writer falling away, which is back to, like, learning what your brain happened. It really is a dissociative state. I, let's just skip to grad school. I studied with Marilyn Robinson, and she just changed my life, which is she just taught me, A, she taught me that I, speak and write and think in circles, which you've already probably noticed. you know. But I would literally write a sentence and be like, I should wait here all day for you to show up at 3 o'clock when you said we'd meet at 2.30, that's a friend. And she was like, that is Yiddish. You know, like, <laughs> so, but she taught me to unravel my brain, but stuff like that. But it was more, I started to get my pitch that way. And the question you're asking is so generous. But I learned that I'm backwards, and it doesn't matter. My job is to know that the pitch is right and I can't control the emotion. So I literally would write what I thought was a hysterical story, share it with friends. They'd be like, that was great. I really cried. And then I'd you know, <laughs> write something sad. And they'd be like, that was really funny. And I'd be like, ah, none of your, it's not my business. I can't, that's my point. Like, I'll never argue with a reader. I can't control. I find that I'm just, again, I'm so moved to be up here. But that idea, I really believe it's shared consciousness when we read. And you know, like, I don't own the books. Like, you literally sell your book. The book that I'm delivering tomorrow, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to deliver it, then have Yom Kippur and Atone start again. But, like, <laughs> the book, my family is very upset about the <coughs> next book. They don't. Anyway, but the point is, like, uh, you know, like, yeah, that you literally sell your book. Like, I don't even own it. Like, I make them, and, I, and they don't become mine. They're whoever reads them. So, yeah, for me, I just want the... Um, I want to know how hard an emotion's hitting and what a sentence feels like, but it's, I, I cannot control... I see that on the other side. Okay. I'm just listening for pitch. Sure. Now, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think, for example, there's a short story um, called Tumblers where um, some Jews from the ghetto get on the wrong train, and instead of being bound, let's say, for Auschwitz, they are mistaken for a group of acrobats about to give a performance. And they have, what, 48 hours or something yeah, like yeah. that to get ready and do flips that they've never done before. Is that funny? Is that sad? But it also, and this gets me in mind of the next question, there's a certain thriller aspect to that particular story. And I just want to overused verb segue <laughs> yeah. uh, to the fact that your, your two novels are in many sense thrillers. Um, whether you consciously work toward that or not, it certainly, I mean, is a good idea for, for sales and gripping yeah. tension. What belongs in a thriller? Oh, that's, well, so, you know, <clears throat> I'd be like, everyone's always, no writer, I don't, I don't know if anyone is, but writers are always, uh, generally unsatisfied, and, and uh, it's funny. We all get together, we all have a good time, and then we all go home and torture our families with something else somebody else has said. And you'd be like, literally, a writer. The you know, I literally look at Wimbledon and be like, looking at this thing with Serena, and be like, why didn't I win? You know, female doubles. You know, and be like, well, not a tennis player, not a woman. But like, still, anyway. Minor details. Yeah, but um, 
but oh, I'm just so literary and thinky and Jewy and all these things. Like for this book, it was so exciting to me. Like if I was fighting to be seen as literary, I would be like, it's not a thriller, but like it was really exciting. You know, like I did all the screen grabs, I admit to it. It would be really fun to be like, you know, at Christmas on Amazon and there'd be like John Le Carre and Nathan and Dean Koontz. You know, like I've never been on these shelves before. But yes, it's a very, very literary novel, but it was really fun to think, you know, the thrill, you know what it is? It's like, we all, I love obscure, like, we all do different things. I, I just wanted this book, this story, not, not just to be in its most accessible form. And I feel like the thriller is really a form that relaxes. You know, it's just, it, it's, it's a friendly form. It's a page-turning form. And as I said, I, you know, we don't need my Israel Palestine. Like, you don't need my 500 pages of ranting or, like, something didactic or me lecturing. So that's, I really thought, if my really pure thing, back to how ideas form, this takes us back to the other question. If my intent of this story is to have people engage with an idea that I care about in a neutral fashion, I thought the thriller is the form for it. And, and that really drove the structure. And of all the things that count as work, I, I read so snobbly and I read in such a bubble, it was so fun to have an education and just read thrillers and see how they tick. And you know, again, it ended up still super Jewy, super literary, all that <laughs> stuff. But it really does have a thriller element, which is fun. And I have to say, back to choosing those things, it's genre. It's the same as we have with you know, gender now. Like People don't have to fit into your idea of gender. You know, it's like such a big discussion that we're all having. Like, sorry, I'm not either. You know, like, people just need to relax. Into so I think, you know, People being forced to choose, but reading, I have so much respect for Le Carre. Like, I'd never read any. Like, Smiley's people, I'm sure he has a very big house from choosing, like, call me thriller. You know what I'm saying? But, like, those books are so beautifully written. They're, like, literary. They're stunning. So, yeah, there's nothing thriller about them, but that the plot moves forward. But I think maybe that's it. I'm really interested in stories. There's people who write for the music of language. I think a story should have a story to it. That's how I read. Something yeah, well, I mean... This novel, among other things, as I say, it, it's really got that thriller pace. You want to keep on turning pages. Think, you see this prisoner Z incarcerated, and you want to know how he got there, and it slowly unfolds in the opposite direction. And that, to my mind, is is real. I mean, there's espionage. It does have the elements of thriller. It also, and, and maybe this is worthwhile bringing up too, it's a love story. Yeah. Um, actually, sort of a double love story in some ways. Um, does, is that something, well, romance and thriller are the two biggest genre sellers in, yeah. in, in the US. Yeah. Um, but I see this as a love story more than, more than you see in the stories. And I think there's a fair amount of development in that. In your first novel, the couple were, I, I guess, like par so. partly, yeah, riven apart. That's right, what you know. Um, this, <laughs> Not my marriage. Th this has up. nothing to do with your marriage now, yeah, that yeah. you've seen more reconcilability yeah, yeah, and yeah, love yeah, yeah. and so exactly. on. Or, right. Good, OK, I'll leave right. it at that. Um, I want to stop soon for Q&A, but let me ask one, again, different question, um, I guess d d deliberately provocative, but um, I'll lead out with a, a nasty quotation from Gore Vidal, uh, who was a good writer and a nasty man, <laughs> who, who, who said, um, memorably, teaching has ruined more writers than drink, um, which, which to my mind means he's never taught, uh, though he drank a lot. Now, you've taught at Hunter and now yeah. teach at NYU. How has that changed your writing, if at all? Oh, uh, and by the way, we could do like a whole hour on uh, good writers and nasty. It's really interesting to me. Well, there's just, I'm very interested in like the graphomaniacs, and there's all different kinds of types, but it's really fascinating. You meet personalized people who really, the, the emotion, you can't be, a, like you have to feel your systems of weights and measures you can be as crazy as you want or off balance in your personal life. Like when you're writing, you, you can't write a book if good and evil, if, if you're writing a book with a good character and evil character and you don't know what that means, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you lack empathy. So it's really interesting because there's a lot of people who are known being like uh, writers leave a, a trail of destruction sometimes. <laughs> and I think it's like they can handle their emotions in the page and it fascinates mm. me because I was like, you can't be wholly a terrible person and write a book that I can connect to that way. And I think it really is like real life is, which is where the drink comes in. I think a lot of people <laughs> are in a lot of psychic pain and can like keep it together for composition and then, you know, chew up everyone around them. But oh, the teaching, you know what? I'm so, if you revere books and they're really, you know, back to the mean writer, I try and be in the nice writer camp, which is, you know, back into this time where we're starting to look at toxic masculinity and stuff like that. It's hard to tell what niceness does for you. I can see where the mean people go. but. Um, 
I'm so susceptible. If anyone says anything's wrong to me that I disagree with, I'm like, is that true? Everything seems true to me. Like even hearing a quote that teaching's bad, I'm like, is it bad? You know, like it's just what you want. You know what I'm saying? Like there's the people who make statements, truisms. But uh, oh, I think teaching is super. It's been really, really rewarding for me. I really love it. A, I'm finally old enough, like it's fun to watch the next generation sure. come up and watch everybody making it. I love that stuff. But I have to say for me, A, it's just a pleasure. I spent so much time like clawing and suffering and trying to figure it out. I love to save 20 years for someone in half a line. You never know what's going to hit. But where I'd be like, oh, your job is to write, like, you know, someone else's job is to sell. But like, I can just, I really love to just share this stuff that like these harder and lessons. But more, I think, back to the, it's so much of what I do, the typing has words, but so much of what we do is just outside of language, you know. The, the psychology of it, the training of it, the I, I can't even tell you. I, I'm really into the. I'm wearing a whalebone corset, but I'm like the gym really calms me. But uh, you know those things where I, like I am not the, I'm not the strongest person in my gym. You're not going to scream what? No. Anyway, but the point is like, I really like to see you know physic the physical to the mental. So I really see the parallels of like training one's mind to do this job and this work and being forced to put things that were outside of language or just physical reflex sure. or put that all into words, it's, I find that really rewarding and sure. really helpful and, and lessons that I bring back you know, to my own sure. work. OK, one last question. Also, they give me Sorry. health insurance. Good point. <laughs> Talk about that later. Um, yeah. One last question is, I think, a fitting capper before, before we throw it open to the audience, which is um, upcoming work. Um, oh, yeah. Kaddish.com, and then since you're putting that to bed soon, any thoughts about after that? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's really st back to doing this work. Like your life, I always, if I was a gymnast, if I were a gymnast, but the point is like it's too late. It's really weird. I still, every once in a while, they'll be like, and you know, they'll still be like the young writer because I'm still ambulatory. You know, like <laughs> uh, it's, you know, you can grow into yourself. I really feel in shape now at this age as a writer. Like I, it's a nice thing. Every book I start feels like my first book and like I'm ready to get going. You know, I, you're just always starting, and I, I love that feeling. But yeah, this book, weirdly, it's coming out in the spring. But everyone's like, that's faster for you. It's plus or minus as long as it takes me to write a book. It's literally 100% faster. You want to give us a brief description of yeah. it? Yeah. I have never, tr I don't know that I've said the title. It's called cottage.com. I have not said the title out loud to anyone, I don't think, or talked about. Uh, I'm really, uh, yeah, it's about. Uh, guilt and technology and omniscience, and it's really just a crazy journey book. But it's got a great setup. Tell us the setup. I really, uh, this is really good to practice me talking about my book in front of all of you. Uh, oh, yeah, basically it's a guy, you know what, I'm the worst at being not religious in the world. Like I'm, I really, you know, the way other people struggle with their faith, I struggle with trying to be an atheist, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so everyone is like, you know, my wife is terrified. They're all like, you're going to be Hasidic in like a minute. Like that any time the switch could flip. So the book is about a guy like me who left the religious world, you know, and he's not saying Kaddish for his father. And then uh, I don't want to ruin it. It flips and flips and Sorry. flips. But uh, yeah, basically like he, yeah, he's left Judaism and then finds his way back. But it's all about like technology and this Kaddish.com website. That Coming out this spring. Yeah. Um, that's about all the questions I have because I don't want to keep on extending the time limit. Um, Eileen, do you want to send around the mic for Q and A? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very oh, much. Very nice. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. If you could please raise your hand if you have a question. Come on. Okay. Great. Thanks, Cliff. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's good. Oh, you're awesome. You, you follow closely modern Israeli fiction, I believe. I know that you were a co-author or co-translator of one of Edgar Carrot's books. Who are some of the younger Israeli writers whom you particularly like and why? And one other question, and then I'll shut up for the whole day, I promise. Um, are you familiar with Tadeusz Borowski? Yes. Yeah. This Way to the Gas, ladies yeah, yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just quite curious right. what you think about that, because I always found that the the apotheosis of something that was horrific and hysterically funny at the same time. Yeah. And those two questions are not connected. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, what, uh, I'll just do this. Uh, again, I love, yeah, all, anyway, after I will do nine hours of Holocaust 
ish fiction with you. But um, oh, uh, the Israel, um, I guess I get frozen in time, but um, I have a whole stack of books. I, I'm in bubble mode now, but I'll talk to you on Wednesday. I was going to say, you get through Chagim, I will get through the Chagim. But um, yeah, no, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't have a list of young Israeli authors right now to regale you with. I was back to being, as I said, as we all get older, Edgar is still my uh, young Israeli author, and he's, yeah, 50. Edgar Carrot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I still read all the, like, you know, classic legendary Israeli authors. And that, uh, yeah, everyone on a list for you is probably my age, like Surya Shalev, and, you know, and, and yeah. I really, uh, yeah, I am, I am, there is a, a new guy on my night table. But uh, yeah, I have no short list of the youngins right now. I try to read them in Hebrew, and that takes me a really long time. Okay. Yes. Coming. Uh, yeah. Really not so different, you and I. I just always wanted to say that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I came to Israel in October '94 and didn't intend to stay, but ended up uh, staying there until uh, 2001. Yeah. So we saw, oh, yeah. we experienced some of the, the and the. Where did you live? Um, Arad, Tel Aviv, Nariya, uh, several different kibbutzim. Yeah. Um, Deganya Aleph, Hazorea. Anyway, uh, so the the Israel of the '90s, I'm still in love with, and in all of its complicated ways that. But everything that I've read and, and seen um, more recently has made me so like disaffected from uh, the Israel of present. And I wanted to know if, if similar um, sort of convoluted uh, feelings about your experience of how you... Yeah. Of well, Israel. I mean, I think you're really getting to the you know um, core of why I wrote this book is because I, yeah, I keep, uh, what is it? Um, a Pauly Shore, who's an Encino man. But I really feel like frozen in time. It's what you're saying, like there was a moment in history. Like it's very strange to pick yourself up, create a new reality that becomes your default reality. For years when I came back from, I mean I'm, a new, I'm like fifth generation American, I'm a New Yorker. For years after I came back from Israel, and then it just stopped. I don't know what chance, it's just me. I'm a New Yorker, I'm an American, and I'd walk into any Israel, they'd just start talking to me in Hebrew, and I was like, did I change, like something in my facial musculature, it really became who I was identity-wise, like a, a Jerusalemite. So yeah, I, I don't recognize a lot of places now. I surely don't recognize this country anymore, you know, like at all, you know, and I feel like you watch these shifts in history, and it's, it's, it is both fascinating, but it's so personal, you know, it's an, it's an ex I think it's really an extraordinary uh, experience. I'm really thankful for it to live in such a charged time in such a charged place. So yeah, I feel like, you know, back to saying like, we'll talk about this kind of literature after, like you and I could have a beer and talk for like a really long time about what that means. I, I really think you're just getting to the core of why I write this book. Like I want that time back. And I think that what's changed now there, which has also changed here, which is why I'm obsessed with dual realities is, is there really is such a thing as truth. It's bizarre that that's even a notion. And I say now, like, I'm in a place like Montclair. I'm sure this room splits. I don't know what the percentages are. But I always say it used to take me a lot longer to explain this book. I could put up two photos now of an inauguration and pull the room and say which photo has more people. And the room would split. And some people would say the photo with less people has more people. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> there's got to be someone who's too frightened to say. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, that's, you know, when they say when you come through the airport and you're like, oh, did I, you know, did you go feed any farm animals or anything like that? Like, the one thing I tracked back from Israel that I, you know, learned from that time, that's at the heart of this book that I now see in America, which is the split reality. Mm. And that's what I want to get back to of the 90s of Israel and here where you can, it used to be spectrums where you could disagree. We could talk about it also. If, you're, if the whole room's going to do that, then school vouchers, then I also know which side we stand on. But the point is, you know, like, you used to be able to have discussions or arguments and it'd be two people on the set, like, on the edges of a spectrum. You could literally be at each other's throats, but be talking about the same reality. And now, there and here, what we have both been infected with, which is literally dual realities. Polarization, yeah. Yeah, like, so where people are literally not even discussing the same facts. As I said, those two photos where 
There's the dissemblers, there's the liars, there's people actually doing nefarious things, and then there's regular people who just have a separate reality that has come down, and that to me was terrifying to see take root there and is terrifying here, because that's it. It took me so long there to be say, oh, I'm living in Jerusalem, and my Palestinian neighbor is living in Il Quds. Like, we're in the same place, breathing the same air, and we are in separate cities. And I said, yeah, both those times, you know, I think they're to be fought for again, but I think that's what was so special there was this moment of connectivity. And I feel like we were really doing that in this country, and it has been dismantled. And that's maybe the larger, darker lesson, which I learned there, which I also see here, is to do good things, it takes so much energy. There's so many people on this planet. We can build extraordinary things together, and we do all the time. But really, both places, it takes so few people to tear the whole fucking thing down. I can't even tell you that peace in Israel, it was right there. I'm telling you on both sides, it, it may be 10. You could probably make a list with 10 names on it from each side that just end a peace that we may never, ever see again, you know? It's in the book. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Um, I, I'm just curious. Um, I find the titles of your books and your short stories amazing, and I'm just sort of Are they long enough? Should I go longer? I'm just curious <laughs> about, you know, sort of how do you come up with the titles? When in the process do you have the titles at the beginning? And I should say that I maybe it's because I'm not Jewish. I thought that the title of your new book was cottage.com. I funny. thought, is he writing a book about real estate? That's like, funny. That? I wish. I wish I had learned enough about real estate. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, my next book called The Last Renter in Brooklyn is what it's going to be called. <laughs> Um, so, uh, oh, you're nice. To, I really like to find, it's funny, because back to it being cottage.com, uh, this goes back to my nice wife, but like, I can't mumble more if anyone asks me what I do. Like, people always ask, what's the name of your book? And I trail off about 30 words into a title. I just mumble, you know, and say, it doesn't matter. Just forget it. But uh, yeah, I really wanted a short title. But I, I think you find, to me, I love, there are the fun days of, of is like when the layout, when you're looking at like, I like that font. It has good serif feet to it. You know, like there's, those are nice days. But uh, yeah, picking a title is really fun for me, and I really love to find it inside the work. So for me, I always find them inside the book every time, inside the story. But you're nice to say, but I like a long title. Any other questions? Oh, there's one in the back. Just a question about your speaking style. <laughs> yes. Are are you on a strict period limit? I mean, you're, 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 it's wonderful to listen to you talk, but your sentences never come to an end. Um, that's so funny. I always say, like, you know what? Choo choose. That is uh, not the first time I've heard that. But uh, oh, choose your career wisely. Like, there's a reason I'm not here for my radio show. Like, that's this is what. But I honestly, I mean, that's back to this. I have to tell you, this goes back to the Marilyn Robinson thing, and goes back to the structure of this book, which is. It took me a long time to understand. I think in circles. I tell stories in circles. I, I have this memory from like lots of holding court. There's like a high school party, and me like nine stories in, none of them ending. And my friend telling these new people, she was like, just hang on. The punchlines will come, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but that's why this book, finally, it's been so long getting linear, because the story has to have A to B to it, that this book, it was really wonderful for me to be uh, allowed to keep the circles in it. But, um, I don't know what to tell you except, yeah, it, it all goes very fast. And as long as everyone laughs, sometimes I just keep talking this way. I, but I, uh, the more important thing, back to the nature of your question, I have, I really try and get along with everyone. I like people. But there are uh, simultaneous interpreters, uh, really, who just, they pale when they see me coming. But it's, yeah, regu regular translation people can do for me. Simultaneous interpreters, they literally have to go, and then they just say, did not finish sentence, did not, I mean, it's just random. So It's if ring think, composition. Yeah, if you think it's bad in English, you should wait with a pause and then hear it in, like, Italian. <laughs> Italian's good. It's friendly to my thing. Yeah, yeah. German's hard. Who are some authors you like to read? Uh, old, like, my old school default, you know, uh, is I love, I love me some Russians. You know, I love, you know, like, Gogol and Dostoevsky and, you know, Turgenev and Americans, I love, you know, Marilyn Robbins, as I said, Cheever Carver, all that. And then I just read, I more and more fight to read broadly and widely. And, you know, I just, yeah, ask people what they're reading. Like lately, I finished, oh, I really got into uh, this book, Station Eleven, I loved. I hadn't read any dystopian fiction. That was so good. Uh, I, I owe you all a night's sleep. Uh, 
not selling my book. I'll sell other people's books today. But uh, oh, Bad Blood, that John Carrey book, the Theranos nonfiction, I like devoured. Couldn't, you know, could not read that faster. But yeah, I just read all over the place, you know, just hungry for books and not even authors. Like if it's working, I'm in. But yeah, you know, I love Borja. I mean, it's just everywhere. Hi. Um, Israelis, Palestinians, there is a very, very old story here. Um, what does your gut tell you about how that story proceeds and if it ends? Do we have no ending? Yeah. Do we have a happy ending? Or do we have uh, a tragedy or none of the above? Well, so this is the, I mean, this is the point of, yeah, as I, like, personal feeling and to what that gentleman was talking about living that period of, of writing this book to explore that notion. It's unacceptable to proceed. Like often I find myself in, uh, and again, I sometimes write about loaded to topics that are, you know, hard for folks. So I'm, you know, I get different questions or different, you know, this is a really loaded one. And some people are just inherently upset by this notion, you know, like that idea of love, you know, of saying like, what if we loved each other? You know, what a strange concept. But I don't understand. All, like literally, if my position here is I'm pitching like we should find peace, I don't understand when people seem really, really angry at me. I was like, so your position is perpetual war? Like I don't understand what the opposite, back to truths. There can be no place, I think, to stand on that is, you can say I am fright. I understand I am frightened. You know what I'm saying? And people here, this gentleman live with me, like my neighborhood, I was in Nakhlo, like I watched that neighborhood blow up a lot. You know what I'm saying? It was very bloody time. Like, I understand what it is to be in mortal fear. I ate in the shook every day when it was just blowing up, you know? So I get what it is to be afraid. I don't get what it is to pitch perpetual war. Like, I don't get it. And the other thing is, if both sides want to win, whether you're saying, like, I don't, you know, like, and that's the other thing I don't understand. Like, you can't not believe in, like, Spain. You know, this notion of people, like, I don't believe in Israel or, like, Israelis or Palestinians. Like, they're people, there's millions of people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand the idea of not, but, but that notion, I really wouldn't root, no matter your politics in here, I really wouldn't root for anyone to win-win because we've seen what that looks like historically. There's million. you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, there are a million and a half people in Gaza. There's, you know, the West Bank. There's millions of people in Israel. Like, I don't understand what winning looks like for either side. I surely don't want to see it. So to me, I think the only thing to work for is two people surviving. I just, so I'm always happy to hear ideas, but I don't see an idea that involves on either, back to spectrum, on either side, I don't see you know, anything that, that works that way, and I don't see how continuing in a conflict that eats people's children is OK. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I didn't need to be a parent to see that. Like, people's kids don't come home. On both sides, I don't see how that is a, you know, something we should continue with. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, over here. This is about process, your writing process. So I see how you you write and think in circles. circles. So yeah. I'm just curious about your writing and editing. Um, so do you write thousands of pages, shut off your editor, and then come back, edit? Yeah. And how long does that take? And how do you know? I mean, especially you, when you it's done. You're yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the only quote I borrow from the NRA. I'm like, when they can pry it from my cold, dead hands. That's, that's when a book is done. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, everything that I've written has been, you know, like a book like this, and thank you for saying it moves, but everything I write has been twice as long, three times as long. I, I, it's not about saving time or everyone's busy. I just feel like stories work. I'm obsessed with negative space, and I want to find that. I mean, it's easiest, like just real life stories. If, you know, it's a, you're all here from a town. There's everyone has their friend, you know, a couple, your friends get divorced, and they're like, oh, you know, she was cheating, he was a brute, and there's two narratives there. You know, like, you're, you know, like how could she have betrayed him? Or like, why, I would have che cheated earlier. He's a monster. You know, whenever we have a story, there's always these missing pieces and dual narratives, and that obsesses me. So I think it's finding what is, as I said, organic. What is living story to me? Until it's living story to me, it's not done. I double write, triple write, and then I cut it down. I find that space, and it has to. I don't accept that notion when people say you can't write a novel like you write a short story. Like, there cannot be, I, again, I can't control how you experience. For me, 
there can't be a comma out of place. It just has to feel its space. So the process is, I guess, compose this out of body experience where you fall away, like religion, like sports, like you know, meditation, yoga, whatever you do, we all have things in our lives that keep us sane. And I think writers train their brains that, you know, it didn't make, you know, I need to write. It's what calms me, but there's that fall away part. That's where the book gets written. And then yes, obsessive redrafting, rewriting, you know, that's I mean again, I've been going till 12, one every night these last weeks. Like, you know, it has to it has to it has to work for you. You know what I'm saying? You get to choose where that line is, but you need to feel it. And again, no one's waiting. There's no rush. Like, I don't understand this idea. There's no rush for books. There's no, like, you know, I'd rather write one, have a person have one perfect short story that's in the world than, you know, I have students, they're always racing. I was like, you want to be the youngest horrible debut? Like, what's your goal? <laughs> you know, like, how about when your book is done, they say, oh, you know, she was a brilliant 34-year-old, as opposed to, wow, that is a stunning failure by a 22-year-old. Like, so yes, I think work should go into the world when it is ready, when it is finished. I just want to add something. You have famously said you throw pages and pages away. I think a lot of us do, and I think a lot of lay people don't realize is the writer doesn't just go like this. The writer goes like this. The writer changes the point of view, because this wasn't working. All sorts of things you try, and you hope you get better at them over time, but the next novel is a fresh start. You make a yeah. different mistakes. That's what keeps it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. There's the metaphor. We'll end on that yeah. metaphor. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're awesome. Good job.